morning. Our scripture reading today comes from the NIV translation, Matthew 5, verse 1 through 12. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Yeah. Thanks, Evan. Yep. Can you all give him <laughs> thanks. Hey, it's good to uh, see so many familiar faces trickling back in today and new faces showing up every week. Just so welcome to you, and we're glad that you are here. Thank you for those that are joining us online as well. And so for the last two weeks, I've attempted to set the stage for what we're coming to today. Many of you would know what Evan just read for us, and they are called the, the Beatitudes. And if you did not hear or watch any of those two previous leaks, like it's okay. I like you a little less, but um, I still love you and so does God. But it would be really cool if you did because in all actuality, like the way we're walking through verse by verse over the next few months, it builds. And to kind of get context for what Jesus is saying in this moment requires some of what we looked at last week. It has, those past, last week has so much explanatory power for what we are going to look at today. And this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' manifesto, is Jesus' longest unbroken block of recorded teaching in any of the gospel. And its rhythm, as it unfolds, is that it teaches first, then it gets lived out by Jesus, which gives demonstration to what it means to be a human, it's a really fancy definition, in the inbreaking reality of the kingdom of God. In other words, it paints one of the clearest, if not the clearest pictures of what it means to live life as Jesus intended it to be lived out of, centered in his love and kindness and identity in his kingdom as part of his beautiful design. And today we're going to look at what in all actuality, yes, it is extraordinarily familiar what Evan just read to us, but it is actually quite a peculiar and controversial intro to his manifesto. Before we do that, though, let me acknowledge a couple of things. And this might be a bit unsettling for you. I don't know. It might be unsettling. Or you may appreciate the honesty and the transparency. Or you're yet to care in any direction. And it's okay wherever you find on that. But what begins today and will follow for the many weeks to come over the course of this summer, summer is my best attempt. Like I am giving it my all with utmost humility to properly understand and teach and apply in head and in heart and in spirit Jesus's teaching. I'm in process just like you are. I have some questions just like you do. And guess what? I am not Jesus. That may be coming as a surprise to you. Um, like it would be far better for you to be a first century Jew in Galilee hearing this firsthand from Jesus or for him to walk into your living room and teach you these words and you to grow up in that area and have the imagination of a first century Jew and know what these stories mean in the kingdom and have grown up on the stories of the prophets and the Psalms and all those things we talked about last week. It'd be great for Jesus to be standing before you to tell you and then you guys go to Sunday lunch or take him to tutors and have a really epic Q&A session. But... We're a bit limited. And so I say that because I want to acknowledge that. One, I'm not Jesus. I'm not Jesus. And what will follow is my best prayerful, studied, humble attempt to understand, interpret, and apply Jesus' teachings for us in this moment. But it's ultimately the Holy Spirit who best teaches, who best clarifies, and who best convicts our minds and our hearts. I am not Jesus, and I am not the Holy Spirit. So don't look for that in me. 
It's cool. Second, and probably a bit more controversial than the first one. <laughs> right now, and down the line of church history, there's actually disagreement about what exactly, like with perfect precision and interpretation and linguistic analysis and then on to application, perfect precision about what exactly Jesus means in some of this. There is disagreement by genuinely loving and mature and brilliant and experienced deep Christian scholars and pastors and historians and academics. Why? Because biblical interpretation is hard and none of us are Jesus. And what exists throughout church history and from the best thinkers of today is really just our best attempt to make sense of God based on scripture itself and then through the matrix of tradition and reason and logic and experience. Now, before that gets too unsettling for you, that is not to say that what we will look at in the next few months is like some jumbled mess that lacks clarity and wisdom and convictional power and theological weightiness, but it is to say when we approach Jesus' words here in Matthew, I want to caution you that I am not Jesus, I am not the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit and Jesus can truly teach you. And secondly, I want to encourage us to open ourselves up to the possibility of seeing with new eyes and hearing with new ears and feeling with open hearts to the possibility of what Jesus is truly saying by inviting the Holy Spirit right now and to this moment to teach and instruct and clarify and equip and edify and challenge and question and encourage every single one of us. Okay? I am not Jesus, you are not Jesus, but we're giving our best attempt here because that's what we do as a community of apprentices following Jesus over the long haul through the hard knocks of life with each other together. And what is most definitely clear is that Jesus in this text that will follow is giving us some really big ideas about what the kingdom is and how your life is meant to be, like how it was created so that you can really experience him and freedom and flourishing and how other people can do that. It is such a arms wide open invitation for people. That's what Jesus is giving us. We'll find that we're not good because we do what Jesus says. No, no, no. We get to experience good because a good father designed a good kingdom and we get to live into it. That's what he teaches us. That's what he'll tell us. That's what he'll do. He'll embody and he'll challenge us for this. So I want, I want to pray. I don't usually pray on the front end here. But here's what I want to pray. And please agree with me. It's written because I want to be precise in this. God, like direct us today and for the weeks to come into your thought process. And out of that mind and imagination, may you transform our minds and our lives. And God... Direct us into your heart's emotions and viewpoint. And out of that set of experiences and feelings, will you transform our affections and our desires? God, we invite you right now to just make your words come alive in a way that maybe we've never seen, maybe we've never experienced. May there be questions answered and may there be questions given where we need to do that. God, I pray that we will take your invitation. Amen. So with that said, let's get to work. All right, so remember, Jesus' primary teaching was not individualistic salvation. It was not community. It was not mission. It was not social justice primarily. It was something broader than that. Something that certainly included, included all those things. It's what Jesus called the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And if that phrase kind of evokes questions or a bit of ignorance, check out last week's teaching or the plethora of other great teachers talking about this. So in last week's text, Jesus said like, repent, stop, look, listen, the kingdom of heaven is near. Which begs the question that we looked at, what is this kingdom of God? And this is where we get to begin to find out because Jesus is telling us in the text that Evan read to us is the beginning of Jesus telling us what the kingdom of God is. And he begins this explanation, this manifesto, this sermon with what is really quite a strange, odd, brilliant, disorienting, provocative way to start off a talk. What sounds shocking and maybe even offensive at first is actually a stunningly beautiful promise right in those beatitudes and for all the note takers if you need a heading or a central question for today's teachings it would be this who is really blessed who is really blessed Jesus starts off his sermon with a list of blessings 
or what is often called the Beatitudes. And that word blessed there is actually the word Marcarius. Can you say Marcarius? Beautiful. And the original, it's that word in the original Greek. And I'll show you why that's important in a moment. So we've got to do a little bit of that work for a second. It's a word that's used all over Jewish writings and pagan literature from the time of Jesus. But it's the reality is it's really hard to translate precisely into an English word because in all honesty, we, we don't have an equivalent for it. Some translations have blessed or blessed. I like that. Thanks, Evan, for reading it like that. Very, very pomp and circumstance for us. Some translations have that, and that's fine. It's what we read earlier. The tricky thing, though, is Marcarius. And is that, like, that's not the word used in Greek or Hebrew for this idea of like a blessing from God or divine favor from God. Another way to translate this word Marcarius in the English would be happy. But the trick there is that when we talk about happiness in America, we have all kinds of conjurings of what that means. Um, so it gets a little disheveled. Some translation actually have the word fortunate or throw a party. Like throw a party. You're poor in spirit. How does that work? Really though, as it was used then, it was more of a salutation. Okay? So like people would walk up and they'd be like, Marcarius, and it would be a conversation starter. It's a way of saying congratulations, like you graduated. You got that new job. I see you out there getting all the right swipes on Tinder. Did I, is that the right way? Whatever it is. Is Tinder still a thing? I don't know. So when someone did really great, they'd be like, Marcarius. But guess what else? Marcarius could also be like used really sarcastically. As we do it, like, oh, congratulations, you won all the graduate awards, and I didn't. Like, you jerk, I want to live through your life. Marcarius. And so Jesus starts off his Sermon on the Mount with this word over and over again. And there's no great perfectly aligned English translation, but conceptually, like, the best way to do it is a word of congratulations. But it's a really pretty bizarre list of eight things that Jesus would be saying, like, congratulations. Congratulations to the poor in spirit. Congratulations to those who mourn. Congratulations to the meek. Congratulations to those in hunger and thirst for righteousness. And so if you were to wipe away all your childhood coloring sheets and all your talks about the Beatitudes today and approach it with the idea of, well, that sounds really odd. Why would Jesus be congratulating the poor? Why would he be congratulating the meek? Why would he be congratulating these people? You might think that Jesus is a bit delusional, a bit of a jerk. And I mean, on earth, that makes sense. But there's something more happening. What is worthy of congratulations in that list? And so I would argue this with great humility, that these opening lines, the Beatitudes, are actually some of the most important of all of Jesus' teaching they're also some of the most misunderstood and misapplied of his teachings. Like scholars who are literate in Aramaic and Greek and Hebrew, who spend all their time in their library studying the life of Jesus and in the original languages, so just so they can write these really technical books for nerds and people like us, they even have different takes on exactly what Jesus is getting at here. But in, with humility... Let me say where my conviction lies in agreement with some of the larger blocks of scholarly approach to these beatitudes by saying first, what this list is not. And number one, the beatitudes are not a list of virtues. Maybe better stated, like it's not exactly a list of virtues. It's not intended to be first as a list of virtuous. Are they a virtuous? Like to a degree, but I would say it's not intended primarily as a list of virtues. Why would Jesus congratulate the poor? Like, do we go after that virtuously? I don't understand that. Some scholars take the Beatitudes and they turn them into virtue statements. And that works to a certain degree with the second half of the list that Evan read for us. But kind of a technical side note, and I'll be less nerdy in a moment. Um, the Beatitudes are divided into those eight statements, into two halves. There are eight blessings. And, but there's a clear distinction, if you were able to look at it in Greek, that between the first four and the second four. And each grouping has exactly 36 words, the first four, the second four. And the first four all start with the same Greek letter. So like Matthew is that kind of guy. 
Like, he's that kind of a guy. He's written this thing almost like a mathematical equation. And so when you get to lines on the second half, like, the merciful will be shown mercy, and the pure in heart will see God, it sounds virtuous. But you have to do linguistic gymnastics to apply that same mentality to the first four. For example, the poor in spirit. Like, you know how it's popularly framed. Those who are dependent on God and who just know how badly they need God. And those who mourn are those who mourn over their sin and over the sin of the world. And the meek are those with power under control. And those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are those who ache for more of God. And that might be right. Certainly there are good actions and reflections of what the kingdom does to us as we live in it. But the problem is, Jesus doesn't actually say any of that. If you look behind the scenes. For example, he just says the poor. Like there are two Greek words for poor. One of which means something like the working poor. Living paycheck to paycheck like most Americans do. Like most of us do. But that's not the word that Jesus uses here. The word that Jesus uses here means like living hand to mouth. In abject poverty. Right on the brink of starvation. Then Jesus adds that phrase, in spirit. The poor in spirit. Like, what does that mean? And guys like Dallas Willard and a few others translate that as like just meaning your spiritual zeros. You have nothing materially or spiritually to offer God or someone else. You're on the brink of starvation. And I think that by poor, Jesus just means poor. Now, let me ask you a question. This is not a trick question. Is poverty a good thing or a bad thing? Like, like it's a bad thing. It's okay to say. It's a bad thing. And I remember the first few times that, like, we led teams to maybe, like, New York City and some of those neighborhoods, or or Los Angeles, some of those neighborhoods, and then internationally to South Africa, a nation that has the largest disparity in the world, the largest wealth disparity in the world. If you've been to, like, Cape Town and, and Pretoria and Joburg, like, some areas are just, man, they are heaven on earth. And then there's the strongest, abject, hand-to-mouth sort of poverty you've ever seen. And the thing is, it's like, it's not just out there. There are people living hand-to-mouth, like within 10 minutes of where you are sitting right now. And it's gut-wrenching. It's almost unfathomable to understand unless you've experienced it. And for us, it's like socioeconomic vertigo. I don't think Jesus is saying that is a good thing. I don't think he's congratulating that. I don't think he's down with that. I, think, I don't think he's down with those who have to mourn. Like some of you have lived in and throughout through a reality of loss for which there simply are not words. And I don't think Jesus is saying that is a good thing. I don't think he is celebrating loss or moralizing loss, loss or making it a virtue to go after. Blessed are the meek, that third statement. I would say that actually doesn't have as much to do with power under control more like, as we tend to talk about it, I would say that it means like, blessed are the powerless, or blessed are the oppressed. Remember, remember from last week, Jesus is talking to a highly taxed people under military occupation of a foreign empire on their ancestral lands. I don't think Jesus is telling them, hey guys, this is a good thing. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, depending on your experience, sometimes when you hear the word righteousness, you may cringe a little bit. Because righteousness, properly defined, doesn't mean first and foremost as the basis, hear that phrase. It does not mean right morality that tends to get bent towards legalism. It means right relationships with God and with others and with yourself and with the earth itself. Now, does moral behavior flow out of that? Of course it does. That's Come on, of course it does. But that's not where it starts. That's a big difference. That's for another week. But those who, so hung, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, it's more likely talking about those that don't have a right relationship with God, with others, with themselves, or with the earth. Are you tracking? Like in our language, it's Jesus saying, blessed are the people that have everything screwed up. You're dysfunctional, you can't hold a job, you can't have a good relationship. He's not creating a list of virtuous pursuits and good behaviors to get you good standing or good image in the sight of God or people. He's saying, hey, all you that are really, really messed up, I've got something coming for you. I got something for you. 
And I'll just throw this in there. Like, I think only us, us people in the West, us people in this particular bubble of the valley, would kind of take these statements and some, somehow psychologize them as something to go after. Because most of us, virtually all of us, have not lived in hand-to-foot abject poverty. If we had, there's nothing inside of you that's experienced that would say, that's a good thing, I'm going to virtuize that and keep going after it. Make sense? Like, if you've not experienced extraordinary loss, like, only us would psychologize that and make that into a virtuous statement, like, to go after loss. If you've experienced loss, that's not a good thing. Jesus would not say, go chase down misery and grief and loss. He wouldn't do that. Now, will I say, like, you have to come back next week to get... The, the, you, you all just need to stick with this because there's going to be things that are unsettling, maybe offensive, questioning. If you only listen to bits and pieces of this, you're going to miss a lot. And then you're really going to say, man, that's not Jesus or the Holy Spirit up there. Um, just so stick with this. Now, are there virtues on this list? Like, yeah, maybe two in that second half. But as a general rule, this is not first or primarily intended as a list of vir- virtues. Secondly, I would say this. It's not a list of commands. If you read it as a list of virtues, naturally the next step is to read it as a list of commands, something you should then go do. I don't believe Jesus is commanding you to go be poor or sad or oppressed or dysfunctional or to screw up your life. It's not in the text. It's not a command. It's a blessing. So it's not a list of virtues per se. It's not a list of commands. And lastly, (laughs) hear me out, it's not a list of timeless truths. Here's what I mean about that. Think about how the world actually works for a minute. Do the meek always inherit the earth? No, not even close. But does Jesus say they do? Yes. So we have this experience and we have what he says. And it's not always the same times. Very rarely do the meek inherit the earth. Usually it's not the meek that run the world. I love what one New York Times columnist recently called. He said that brilliant jerks run the world. Washington, D.C. is not full of a bunch of meek folk. Like, that is not how this plays out. Do the merciful always receive mercy? No, not even close. Our brothers and sisters in Bhutan that I got to know through my days at seminary who were tortured for their faith certainly were not shown mercy. By the way, they graduated yesterday, and it's pretty incredible. I'd love to introduce them to you someday. They graduated. It's an incredible story of God's beauty. But a merciful, here's these Bhutanese refugees, merciful and nonviolent people living up against a totalitarian government, they certainly did not receive mercy back. Many were tortured, some were killed, and some were permanently injured for their merciful faith. Do the merciful always receive mercy? No. So if you read this as a list of timeless truths in that sense, that it always happens on earth, you end up with the problem. Because either Jesus is wrong, or we're wrong, or something is wrong because it doesn't exactly work. And we'll work through that dilemma in just a minute. So what is this list? What are the Beatitudes? And in this bizarre, peculiar, slightly offensive opening to his message, does he have your attention yet? I believe that primarily the Beatitudes, and when I say I, I mean that with like backing that we could, like footnotes if you want to talk about it. Like, I believe that primarily the Beatitudes are about three things. They are a welcome, They are a promise, and they are a commission. First, this is a welcome. This is a good day for the note takers after I was a storyteller last week, so you're welcome. Uh, But this is a welcome, and here's what Jesus, like, picture this. Go back to last week. You're that first century Jew. You're under military occupation. Your taxes are crazy. Your uncle's a debt slave on this orchard that he owns. You're poor. You're living hand to foot, and life is kind of miserable Here's what Jesus is saying to anyone who can identify with anything on that list. He's saying, listen, my kingdom is yours. 
My kingdom is yours. I mean, isn't that beautiful? You're poor. My kingdom is yours. You're sad. You're depressed. You're grieving. My kingdom is yours. You're dysfunctional. You have nothing together. My kingdom is yours. The beginning of the Sermon on the Mount is not a to-do list. It is a good news list. You should be happier about that. It is a good news list. Remember, Jesus had just announced that the kingdom of heaven is near. And then he calls his disciples, and then he goes up on this hill, and the first thing out of his mouth is a list that is a list of good news. Jesus is describing who has the most to gain by the arrival of his kingdom. He is not prescribing what you must do to enter it. Say that again. He's describing who has the most to gain, not what you must do to enter it. Now, when you hear that phrase, good news, let's go back to academic for two minutes. What does that mean to you? And whatever that means to you right now, in Christian circles, we have a word for that, and it is the gospel. The gospel literally means good news. This begs the question what is the gospel? What is this good news? Is it what we just said? Or is it something different? And in American culture right now, really globally, I just say American, but like there's kind of a running debate about how to best define the gospel. And there tends to be two viewpoints with lots of in-betweens. One that defines gospel simply as justification by grace through faith and not by works. And that is certainly theologically accurate when it comes to how salvation and justification works. Like, I'd stake my life on it. I'd stake the credibility of who we are together on the factuality of that statement. It's one of the few mountains that I would die on, okay? But, two, there is a growing pushback to that view by men and women across the world, not theologically when it comes to how justification works, but that it is a little bit short-sighted of what all else is part of that good news, And the folks pushing back are saying, wait a minute, like, I'm not sure that's how Jesus defined the gospel, and I'm not sure that's how the early church defined the gospel exactly. Because Jesus defined the gospel, we read it last week in chapter 4, verse 17, this way, that repent, stop, look, and listen, the kingdom of heaven has come near. That was kind of his one-line summary of this thing. And the early church defined the gospel another way. If you have a paper Bible... I don't know if you guys still carry those or have those. And, you wanna, and you're following along and you turn back a page to the top of this letter, this book of Matthew. What does it say? It says the gospel according to Matthew. And you go to the next one. And the next one. The gospel according to Mark. Gospel according to John. The gospel according to Luke. So what's the gospel according to the early church and the way they titled these letters? It's everything in Matthew from chapter 1 to the end of the book in chapter 28. So the gospel according to the early church is the whole story of Jesus from his birth to childhood to his baptism in the Jordan River to his time in the desert to his miracle work to his teaching, his kingdom, his rebellious, his rebellion against the religious hypocrisy, his nonviolent fight with the power brokers of the day, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his return to the right hand of God and his promise to return on earth to rule and reign. All of that is the gospel. Obviously, my bias is coming through a little bit as I get excited about that last statement. But you have to, if you define the gospel as Jesus is king and the kingdom is coming, or repent, the kingdom of heaven is near, then you still get justification by grace through faith and not by works as a subplot in that much larger narrative. And all that to say, like you actually get all of that right here at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount because as he says it, The gospel is that the kingdom is coming to the on all the least likely of people. Not the rich, but the poor. Not the happy, but the sad. Not the powerful, but the weak and the powerless. Not those that have it all together and are good and moral and religious and guys who button their shirts all the way to the top. Like, but that was a style for a minute. I don't know if it is. Um, Or girls who say no to spaghetti strap and short shorts or wear a t-shirt over their one piece at youth camp. Like, Not those people, but those of us who don't have it all together. Those are the ones who are blessed. Those people are in the kingdom. Those people are wrapped up in the new reality that Jesus is bringing to bear on the world. And they did not do anything but show up. That's what Jesus is announcing. You see, 
when you start by turning this list into a list of virtues or commands. My fear is, and really I've seen it, but my fear is that once you start applying it that way, it actually becomes the exact opposite of justification by grace through faith and not works. Here's the gospel, you guys. Like, hey, you, your life is kind of a mess. Come on into the kingdom. Blessed are you. Hey, you, you're really sad and you've had extraordinary loss. Your heart is grieving. And your life is not the narrative of successism that everyone tells you that you are supposed to have. Come on in. You're welcome. Take the best seat. Hey, you, you're poor. Not just at a material level, but even at a spiritual level. Like, come on in. Mission is free. You're welcome in my kingdom of God. Take the best seat. Eat all that you can handle. So he opens it up like that. And then watch what happens. Out of that blessing, like this is why the Beatitudes are at the top of the message. It's a list of good news. And then out of that blessing and welcoming, you get the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. You get the manifesto as a whole new way to be human in the inbreaking reality of the kingdom of God. It's a mouthful every time I say it, but it's so good. Like you get Jesus saying, okay, now that you're here, now that you're, you've eaten, now that you're at the table, now that you're with friends and welcomed, here is how you live in apprenticeship to me and my way. And it is in that order. Welcome. You're blessed. Come on in. No strings attached. Free admission. Bring all of you. Don't fake it. Now, now, now that you're here, and now that hope you're living out of love and connection and grace and in the center of your identity and who he is, let's begin to do some work. Because I created you a certain way. That I don't want you to just do that because it's the right thing. I want you to do that because when you live as part of the design of my kingdom, when you begin to strip away the parts of the sin and the death that this life has brought on you, you will actually live in a way that I meant for you to live all along. And all the joy, all the happiness, all the flourishing, all the freedom that you've been chasing will actually just chase you down. It's in that order. Like, come on. Isn't that beautiful? So first, it's a welcome. It's a good news list about the gospel. The kingdom includes all of this. Secondly, it is a promise. The promise that is going on here is deep and profound, and it's something that's really, really, really easy to miss. And I think I did for a number of years, honestly. And the promise is this. That in the promise of this good news list, Jesus is radically redefining who is actually blessed. So when we ask the question, who is actually blessed, he's telling us. And it is counter to every story and every narrative and every cultural value and every statement that we put in our front yards and into the soil of our own cultural narrative. It is counter to all of that. It was counter to the first century Jews. And let me show you. So this is not a translation, but this is my attempt to localize and modernize what Jesus is saying to us and to people in this moment. So let me take these Beatitudes and just Eugene Peterson it for a second, okay? He says this. Is that a, did I use that as a verb? I like that. He says this. I say this. Congratulations to those on welfare those waiting in line at food banks, those surviving on rice and beans. If discovering your calling is a luxury in some distant fantasy and bringing home diapers and baby formula is this week's big dream, you're blessed because my kingdom is all yours. Congratulations to those wailing loudly at funeral halls, those grieving quietly another miscarriage, those carrying the daily weight of depression because there's a source of comfort that will wipe away every tear from your, final, from your eye a final time. And to the quiet ones, the gentle ones, those taken advantage of, you are lucky. Lucky. That's the secret path to the only kind of power you can keep. If your stomach growls with hunger pains for justice, for fair wages for every worker, a fair trial for every offender, fair opportunity regardless of where you were born, if your throat is dry because there still isn't equity, there still isn't reconciliation, how long, O oh Lord, until that hunger will be satisfied and that thirst quenched once and for all? 
Congratulations to those who offer forgiveness when a grudge would be justifiable. To those who refuse to write anyone off, even him, even her. The king has a soft spot for people like you. Congratulations to those who hang on to innocence, who resist the corruption of cynicism, who don't find their rest in overindulgence or their status in exaggeration. You'll glimpse the glory of heaven through that common resistance. You're blessed when you choose the path of peace, when you offer your left cheek because your right one is already bruised, when you keep treating them with dignity even when they treat you like garbage because you bear a striking resemblance to your father. Congratulations if you've been mocked, excluded, misunderstood, or held back because of the name of Jesus. It's only because you're a stranger here. The kingdom of heaven is your home. You're blessed when you're made fun of, thought less of, and passed over because of me. When that happens, throw a party, laugh like someone who's unafraid because that's just how they treated the great ones. Does Jesus have your attention yet? That's what he is saying to us. He welcomes and he gives a promise and then he invites us into a whole new way to be human in the inbreaking reality of God. The Beatitudes are a welcome. And they are a promise. But what about, what, but Matt, that's great. And that felt good. Like I've got a tear in my eye. But what about the problem with the fact that he promises mercy, but people don't get it? What about the fact that I'm trying to be a peacemaker and all that is happening is I'm pushing people further away? What happens with the fact that I'm working two and three jobs and I just can't get out of this hole? What do I do with that? How do I deal with that? Where's the promise in that? Where's the kingdom in my experience? I mean, Jesus says the kingdom is mine and the kingdom is yours, but what exactly do you mean? And here's how I answer that. It's a tension, it's a paradox in some ways, but it is true nonetheless. We have to understand that the kingdom of God is both a current reality and a future promise. This is what theologians call the already and the not yet, or the overlap of the ages, or for even they, this is, I like this one, they offer the idea of it's an unfinished symphony. Like the kingdom is right now, and it's not quite yet. Dang it, it's not quite yet. Like that's how we feel. And now, like you can read about this in theology book after theology book after theology book, but you don't need to do that. You can feel this. You feel this. This is our experience to be human. I mean, this week I experienced answered prayer for someone I've been praying for for a long time in a relationship with. And I saw a former student of mine have to bury her mom who suddenly unexpectedly passed away with no warning or no history. All of that happened this week. All of it. Both. And I think the best way to describe this is through a picture. Like way back at the beginning of the story in Genesis 1, heaven and earth were not separate realities. They were one and the same. Like if you were to mention heaven to Adam and Eve, they'd be like, what do you mean? What do you mean? It's like asking a fish about water or us about breathing. It was all they knew. It was all they had ever known. There was no separation until that conflict that we call sin drove the two apart. And now the mission of God, like we said last week, is about reuniting heaven and earth, about reasserting his kingdom, about reasserting his authority among us rebellious people. And through Jesus, access to that reality can be granted to anyone who wants it. But it's not mandated for the entire world. Not yet, at least. And so when I say that the kingdom of God is both a current experience, and a future promise, here's what I mean. There's an overlap. There's an overlap between heaven and earth, the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of man, mercy and not mercy, peace and violence. There is an overlap in the middle. There's a way to live in this world as a preview of heaven so that your life becomes the space where heaven and earth meet. If you are an apprentice of Jesus, this is where you are. And guess what? This is the promise of who you are, but it's also the commissioning because your life is to bring heaven to earth and you are the bridge, you are the gap, you are the overlap for the people that are around you in the same way that you 
God, through Jesus, he brings you the overlap to once again feel and experience and know God. Your life now lives in the overlap for the sake of other people. And the beatitude, Jesus names the overlap. He gives a name to the space where heaven and earth touch. It exists in the poor. It exists in the mourning. It exists in the, the powerless. It exists in the justice seeker, in the merciful, the pure hearted, the peacemaker, the persecuted. It exists in you. It's Jesus saying, this is for you. My kingdom is yours. Come in, sit at my table. Welcome. There's a promise in that. It's here. It's forever. But there's also a responsibility in that. There's a commissioning in that. There's a calling in that. There's a purpose in that. He promises he'll put it all together back again. Think of it this way. The Beatitudes are wildly insensitive and a bit delusional unless in the same breath you are promising an end to my pain. Unless in the same breath you've parachuted into my unique brand of suffering and endured it with me by moving into the neighborhood. Unless in the same breath you promise to wipe away every tear from my eye one final time. And that's exactly what Jesus is promising. He is saying to you, and he is saying to us, I will not stop until every last bit of this is restored to be like this. So the Beatitudes are a welcome. And they are a promise and they are a commissioning. I'm going to say it this way. It is a kick to the butt. You got this? Do something with it. That's what it is. And I believe that all three of these come together. That was a terrible kick. I believe that all three of these come together in a story that I want to read to you about a cellist in a war zone in the 1990s. Some of you may actually know this story. I want to read this. And um, they're actually, you guys can go ahead and turn that on. Like, this will make sense in a moment. That on May 28, 1992, the principal cellist in the Sarajevo Opera, dressed in his former black tails and sat down on a fire-scorched chair in a bomb crater to play what you're hearing right now. Close your eyes if you want to. Listen along. This is Albanoni's Adagio in G minor. If you know music, if it's written in minor, it is sad. <laughs> but the site was outside a bakery in Smoljlavich's neighborhood where 22 people waiting in line for bread had been killed the previous day. During the siege of Sarajevo from 1992 to 1995, more than 10,000 people were killed. The citizens live in constant fear of shelling and snipers while struggling each day to find food and water. Smajlovic near, lived near one of the few working bakeries where a long line of people had gathered when a shell exploded. He rushed to the scene and was overcome with grief at the carnage. And for the next 22 days, one for each victim of the bombing, he decided to challenge the ugliness of war with his only weapon, beauty. Known as the cellist of Sarajevo, Smajlavich not only performed outside the bakery, but continued to unleash the beauty of his music in graveyards, in funerals, in the rubble of buildings, and in the sniper-infested streets. I never stopped playing music throughout the siege, he said. My weapon was my cello. Although completely vulnerable, Smajlavich was never shot. It was as if the beauty of his presence repelled the violence of war. His music created an oasis amid the horror. It offered hope to the people of Sarajevo and a vision of beauty to the soldiers who were destroying the city. A reporter asked him if he was crazy for playing in a war zone. And Smajlovich replied, why do you not ask if they are crazy for shelling Sarajevo? See, there is a welcome, and there is an invitation that is good news when you live in the overlap. This unfinished symphony that is the inbreaking reality of the kingdom of God. 
And there's also a way in which your life gets commissioned like the cellist of Sarajevo, where it can shine as the overlap, the unfinished symphony playing right in the middle of your mess. And through God's plan and his power and his love and his kindness and all the inbreaking reality of his kingdom, one day, all your poverty, all your sadness, all your dysfunction, and all your powerlessness, and all of that for everyone else will be made new for those that have trusted in God with this good news. It will be restored. This is the kingdom, and this is what the Beatitudes welcome, promise, and commission. It is Jesus saying to each of us today, you're sad? Come home. You're poor? Come home. You're a mess. Come home. You're oppressed. Come home. My kingdom is for you. Come home and let me show you how you're meant to experience what I've made for you all along. Come home. Let me pray. And you can stay seated actually for a moment. And in fact, um, I want to invite you all, if anyone wants to pray or talk, or if you have a need where you need to experience a little bit more of that overlap, like, I'm going to go to the family room and meet me there, okay? Let's pray. Father, in a war-torn experience of our dysfunction, our sadness, and our loss, and our grief, and our lack, and our struggle, and even in the good, the victories, the truth, the family, the singleness, the widowing, God, all of it, in marriage and divorce, and kids that are like just killing it in life, and those that are wayward and we don't know what to do next, in the middle of all that is your inbreaking overlap. God, it is your life, it is your love, it is your world, it is your power, it is your mercy, it is your peace, it is your sustaining of everything, God, that we cling to. God, I pray today for those that need more of the overlap. Would you just mess with their circles a little bit, give them a, more, a bigger dose of heaven today? God, will you teach us and instruct us and give us community in a way that we can live in that overlap with a fuller, brighter, stronger, more meaningful experience than we ever thought was possible? And for those that are still living in a way where there is no overlap, where there is darkness that has overcome their thinking, their life, their emotions, their view, their sexuality, everything in between, God, I pray, God, that you would help to restore to its original intention all that you have for us. I pray that you will save I pray that you will strengthen. I pray that you will bring clarity and conviction. God, I pray that you will give us an impetus to move with our lives, that we will not just sit here in this overlap, but we will live with power on mission in this overlap, that it would never be said of our lives and our families and our homes in this church that all we did was have a kumbaya happy club living in the overlap, God. Man, like rock us of that. God, I pray that our lives would be about what you are about. And these beatitudes, may be, they be the invitation of your welcome, of your promise, and your commission. And may our lives be changed, utterly changed, every single one of us. May they be moved, every single one of us. God, may they change our thinking. May they change our feelings. May they challenge what we hold that we think is real, but it is like a whole new way to be human that you are actually inviting us towards. God, would we reject, I'm just going to say, we reject every ounce of autonomous, individualistic, Americanized, success-driven Western views of happiness and meaning that is in us. We want to live the way that you live. We want to take you seriously. We want to be bold. We want to be loving. We want grace and truth to be the same side of every relationship and every conversation and every feeling that we experience. And we love you. We thank you for the invitation. We thank you that... You came down and wrote an unfinished symphony in the chaos of our life. And we look forward to the day that you finish it. But in the meantime, in the overlap, help us to know you, to experience you, and help us not to take any of this for granted. I thank you for each person in this room and everyone that is online. May this be a real moment. May we be a real community that is lit on fire by your love, by your truth, by community, not for us, but for you and for the people that have yet to experience the overlap. May we be the leading edge of that overlap in our lives. In your name we pray, amen.
Amen.